We are delighted to be joined by Christian Catalini, the Chief Economist at the DiEM Association. Never out of the news, DiEM has made an enormous impact on our discussions at the Digital Monetary Institute over the last 18 months. We've had some private sessions with Christian and his colleagues and some public sessions. This is a public on the record session entitled From Cryptocurrencies, Stablecoins and DiEM to CBDCs. Over to you, Christian. Thank you, and it's a great pleasure uh, to be here with all of you today. Um, I, I wanted to take a little bit of a broader perspective and try to place not only DM, but you know what's happening within CBDCs and in the public uh, sector in, into perspective. <clears throat> so I plan to focus, you know, the initial part of the presentation on a broader introduction, then move to kind of some of the design choices uh, that we've made uh, with DM, and then discuss briefly, you know, how can we think about private public. Um, partnership in, in this space. Uh, it's a space that has you know, really exploded in, in, in terms of growth of attention projects and, and really scale. Uh, when, when I designed the MIT Digital Currency Experiment in, in 2013-14, here you're looking at kind of the Google Trends for some of the keywords. Um, you, you can see the level of attention was much, much lower. And we've went through, I think, different waves of iterations. And so I think it's important to uh, take a step back and ask, you know, again, what, what is going on uh, across all these different parts of the economy and different sectors. <clears throat> to, to economists, I think, you know, blockchain in general is all about new market design. Uh, we wrote a, a piece some time ago where we tried to really identify what are the key fundamental costs that the technology reduces. That's kind of a classic uh, economic trick uh, to really understand where the technology is going. If you can identify what costs are, are really dropping, then the, the effects of the technology on society become a little bit more clear. I think we talk a lot about reduction in the cost of verification, so cheaply verifying digital information. Uh, but I would say uh, that the second cost, what we call it in the piece, the cost of networking is probably the most uh, transformational. But focusing on, on the first one, right? So uh, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, CBDCs really allow us to build data integrity from the ground up uh, and, and really deliver on what you could call costless verification of information. Now, th there's a big caveat in that, uh, which is that, you know, verification is, is cheap and effective in a digital space, but you immediately face last mile frictions. Uh, so, you know, when you're kind of trying to figure out what, what can blockchain not do, uh, or even a CBDC, uh, in general, at that interface between the online world and the offline one, we still experience massive frictions. And this is where improvements, for example, in digital identity standards uh, or any other sort of link between the offline world and the online one, I think will, will require um, a number of complementary investments by different private uh, sector participants and also public sector ones uh, to, to eventually realize the, the full potential of the technology. When we talk about cost of networking, really what we have in mind is the ability to operate you know, a new type of marketplace. It could be transactional network, uh, for payments or you know, uh, a decentralized marketplace without assigning control uh, as it happens today to the platform architect. And so the fundamental economics uh, that, that blockchain really, uh, I think opens up is different types of trade-offs uh, between uh, competition, uh, the contribution that different participants can bring and the kind of system that you can really design um, in, in, in such an ecosystem. <clears throat> and so, you know, when, when you think about cost of networking, you should really think about interoperability. And, and I think that's one, one of the most uh, interesting aspects here is really the intersection between interoperability on one hand and programmability. These are really two interesting building blocks that when you think about, you know, okay, money is already digital. Why should the public sector even explore uh, something like a CBDC or even a retail CBDC? It's because you know, very much like rolling back to the history of the internet, all the way back to the R&D work being done, uh, for example, by um, public institutions in the US and eventually turning into the commercial internet that we know today, uh, that shared infrastructure, uh, those building blocks are extremely important, really unleashing an entire wave uh, of innovation. Programmability is particularly interesting because when you think about what's different about the economics of things like cryptocurrencies, blockchain, uh, or even CBDCs, is that because of their modular nature, because of the much lower barriers uh, to coming and building on a system of this type, uh, the growth when it comes to applications, use cases, and new types of business models uh, really quickly becomes exponential. 
Uh, nothing of this is somewhat new. Uh, to some extent, you know, we've been witnessing now decades of uh, internet level applications, kind of unbundling services that were bundled together, recombining it, uh, realizing kind of opportunities for new types of aggregators, curators, uh, and new types of services. Uh, and, and this is now kind of coming to the financial sector uh, in, in, in a re, really renewed uh, force and, and, and fashion. Now, uh, I'm gonna talk a lot more about interoperability in payment when it comes to DM, but I would like you to think about these building blocks as, as being much wider uh, than just payments. Uh, and, and I think we're seeing a number of examples. If you think about decentralized finance or DeFi, tremendous growth in that space. I think a lot of really interesting models and concepts um, and, and also challenges, and I'll get back to this uh, in a second, uh, but essentially bringing interoperability, programmability uh, to the financial sector, to how we really deploy financial assets, exchange them, and really build services and products around them. Uh, now, there, there's of course a change, uh, I would say market structure, uh, because a lot of these technologies operating very much like the open protocols of the internet, I, I think change um, how new participants can compete, for example, with incumbents, um, and also new regulatory challenges. I think for regulators, uh, the, the main question is really, how do you really bring the safety and some of the provisions that we've come to experience in traditional markets and take advantage of the upside of the technology when it relates to, for example, more transparency, uh, higher visibility, um, and, and better privacy uh, designs uh, without some of the potential side effects. Um, you know, decentralized finance is one example of this kind of modular blocks coming, coming alive. I think NFTs or non-fungible tokens are, are really the, the, the other example that we're witnessing. And when you think about NFTs, you should think about any sort of digital media, digital content. Uh, there's, there's current economics and digital platforms that run all of these assets and how, for example, creators interface uh, with, with their fan base. Um, I think here we're seeing, again, the unbundling of a lot of these services and recombination in, into novel ways. So not only are kind of intensive margin applications, so doing more of what you were doing before, uh, potentially cheaper and more efficiently, but also the opportunity to create new types of services and, and products. Very much like with the early blockchain application, that link between the offline record and the digital representation is still very important. And so for example, you could have an NFT that represents a piece of digital art, but the copyright enforcement associated maybe with, with, with that contract uh, would still rely on, on, on outside institutions. So there's a broader movement um, around removing intermediaries. Uh, and, and, and I think one of the key challenges with that narrative is that of course, intermediaries play an important role in society. And so until you see new intermediaries emerge, um, these markets will, will, will need new types of protections and oversight uh, to really achieve their full potential. Um, and, and you know when you think about things like DeFi, I think one of the key challenges is really you know, beyond the profit motive, if you have a platform or you have a protocol that's really connecting um, different parties and they're transacting, how do we ensure that these new markets reflect broader values and principles that society relies on? Uh, think about fighting financial crime and ensuring that there's no market manipulation or insider trading and, and, and alike, just to make some examples. Uh, we recently wrote a piece with Scott Commoners at Harvard uh, around really, you know, this not being another instance of software eating the world. Um, I, I think it's a little bit broader than that. And in fact, institutions can play a key role, whether it's the, the public sector or it's uh, you know, public-private collaborations uh, to, to take advantage of this technology, starting with cryptocurrencies, blockchain application, DeFi and beyond, or even CBDCs. I think the, you know, the public sector will have to come and really set the right um, rules uh, so that this can flourish and eventually reach mainstream uh, adoption. <clears throat> Really briefly, what are some of the key long-term benefits of the technology? Uh, because it allows for more interoperability, because it drops the cost of operating this critical infrastructure uh, at a lower cost and with less uh, kind of market power concentrated in a few pl places, um, it's gonna be uh, eventually a catalyzer of a lot of innovation. And through that, I think consumers and businesses will experience a lot more choice. A lot of this choice would really rely on interoperability. So the fact that you know, say you're using one digital wallet, you're fully interoperable with the users of a smaller maybe digital wallet that have made different choices um, regarding their preferences, you know, on what they care about. <clears throat> uh, it is an opportunity to lower barriers to entry and really work on financial inclusion and expand access to financial services. 
uh, remove lock-in that I think uh, people have experienced in, in, in existing services and start unbundling things that again, are, are together for historical reasons, but may not need to be uh, together anymore. And by unbundling them, you're really giving people more choice. And so a merchant, for example, could, um, could choose between a basic payment functionality that replicates uh, some of the functionality of cash or some of the added value services that involve chargebacks and, and things of that type. Uh, the other part that I think a lot of the, uh, you know, uh, cryptography and, and, and cryptocurrency researchers are really focused on is privacy by design. And so really building better trade-offs when it comes to, uh, for example, a combination of compliance, uh, but also uh, retaining uh, privacy. Uh, again, you can have increased transparency and accountability in the system, but you also need to think about side effects if, if some of that information is too widely available or, or could be abused. And, and very much in the spirit of you know, the, the long-term benefits of this technology is how we've been thinking uh, now for about three years um, about the design of DM. Went through a number of iterations. Our first white paper uh, was extremely naive. It had a number of gaps in areas that needed substantially more work. But I think some of the fundamental values and principles have stayed uh, really the same, uh, if not evolved, again, based on feedback uh, from regulators. So what are some of the key objectives of the economic design of DM? So the first one is really building trust in, in the payment tool, right? So think about the coin. Um, how do you ensure that people can rely on it uh, for traditional payments, for merchant payments, for uh, all the sort of things that uh, would matter in a cross-border setting like remittances, and that that value is really preserved uh, even in stress market condition. Uh, the second key goal of the economic design of DM is the resulting market. Uh, you know, uh, there's a number of um, consensus protocols and approaches uh, in the cryptocurrency and blockchain space. Often they lead to extreme market concentration, whether it's in mining or some complementary activities. And so one of the guiding principle here is we're really ensuring that the protocol could support a highly interoperable shared infrastructure um, where, you know, a large player, a small player can interoperate and compete on a leveling playing field. Uh, and last, really, the governance, right? All of these new projects really have, have, have challenges in terms of like the online offline link and governance is really the uh, representation of that. Now, this slide has a lot of information. Um, I, I think you hear a lot about stablecoin and I'm putting them in quote uh, because I, I think, you know, the, the fact that we're labeling them all with the same category actually does a disservice, a disservice to consumers. Here's one dimension uh, that I'm focusing on, but there's many others that I think are really important when it comes to consumer protection and financial stability. When you think about something that's trying to, for example, to peg against the US dollar, the key building block of that is the relationship to the reference asset. Uh, so the reference asset, of course, in, in, in the case of a dollar would be uh, a US dollar. And, and you wanna ensure that that value is preserved under a wide range uh, of market conditions. Now, what's interesting is that actually, once you open the hood of a lot of the stable coins that are alive and, and some of these are substantial market share and, and market cap, uh, that relationship can be pretty weak. Uh, and here you're seeing this arrow going from completely not correlated uh, to perfectly correlated. I mean, I, I, I would say, and this is a bit of a misnomer, but you know, the, the perfect stable coin would be, would be a CBDC, so a central bank claim. Uh, on this spectrum, if you start from the left, you have a number of dollar denominated stable coins, for example, that are just under collateralized. How are they backing their tokens? They're essentially backing it often with their own governance token. Now that's all good news as the ecosystem grows and it's scaling and everybody's optimistic, but the moment you have a change in expectations, those dollar denominated stable coins would, would essentially uh, lend into a dead spiral and their value could plummet to zero. And this is something that, for example, we've seen um, in um, currency boards and other settings where you know trying to maintain the peg, but the assets are not exactly uh, the ones that you're trying to, to reference to. Uh, you, you have all sort of interesting models where you're over collateralizing the coin. Uh, for example, when you're trying to create something that's decentralized and, and maybe back with crypto. Uh, now, of course, a large market dislocation in the relevant crypto assets would also break, uh, break the peg. I would say that the vast majority of the market right now is in what are called like one-to-one -one fiat back ones. Um, I think we, we need to do a lot better than that. Uh, most of these have minimal, if any, uh, buffer, uh, capital buffers. And, and when you think about frameworks such as the Basel III one for banking and financial institutions, what that really means is that that relationship to the reference asset may be fine in normal market conditions, but if you have a massive shock, think about a large interest rate shock and say they're holding some of this in treasuries, 
Uh, how do you cover those losses and really ensure those redemptions one for one for fiat? So DM is, is, is kind of the next category. So one-to-one -one fiat back with uh, what are technically called high quality liquid assets. So on top of the one-to-one, -one, it, it's not enough to be one-to-one. -one. There's additional buffer to really absorb losses. Uh, again, whether there's a large dislocation uh, in interest rate markets, or uh, for example, you'd imagine the case of, uh, of default um, of, of, of a bank that the stablecoin is relying on. Uh, now, of course, there, there's one step further, which would be even better, which is a central bank digital currency. And I'll get back to that uh, in, in a second. On our side, uh, again, the, the journey from an economic design of the reserve has been really one uh, to take the feedback, for example, from the G7 stablecoin report or the FSB report on stablecoin and structure the reserve so that, you know, even under stress market conditions like the one we saw in the early COVID phase or in 2008, this reserve can, can kind of meet those redemptions. Uh, not only DM does not fractionalize asset at the reserve level, but something that is not really talked a lot about is that DM will essentially prevent fractionalization at the VASP level. So VASP, like virtual asset service providers, are typically wallets and exchanges. And what you're often seeing in the stablecoin ecosystems today, also through DeFi, is extreme leverage in these assets. Why is leverage a problem? Is because you know, these stablecoins do not have a backstop, right? Like traditional banking. And so if you have an extremely leveraged network, what could happen is that a run in DeFi uh, could translate into a run in the stablecoin, the underlying asset, and, and a collapse of the peg. Uh, just imagine the loss of confidence if, if that were to happen. So in the case of DM, again, uh, not only you, you'll have transparency on, on, on kind of the assets in the reserve, but you'll also be able to see kind of all these regulatory capital requirements are being added uh, to ensure kind of smooth sailing under, under a number of market conditions. <clears throat> More importantly, we don't think um, that, you know, maybe five or 10 years from now, there will be such a thing as a DM dollar. Um, ideally, if you have a CBDC, we would be able to literally phase out uh, our own token and integrate with the public sector. I will get back to why this is important, uh, but what, what's important to stress here is that DM really sees collaboration with central bank as the future extension of the network. Um, it just you know, provides a better reserve design. And, and to some extent, we're, we're initially retrofitting faster digital payment rails on the legacy rails uh, as a bridge measure until you have CBDCs. Now you may wonder if you're phasing out your reserve, what's the business model? Uh, now it's important to stress that the DM Association works very much like a standard setting organization. So you have 26 members, they all have equal voting power, so no, no single member has control. And the DM Association is, is, is really in charge of coordinating investment in, in, in the shared infrastructure, the R&D. You have a classic tragedy of the commons happening even in some of the permissionless network where without a foundation, without essentially effort in funding, say core developers, it becomes really difficult to ensure that that's kind of an ongoing commitment because they're classic externalities problems. Um, of course, a, a big part of the mission is also financial inclusion. And so you could see in the future, the DM Association working together with, with governments on, on implementing better cash transfer, economic aid, uh, and, and, and other things on its rails. But the business model is it's a transactional one. So you know, at scale, this is gonna be a network that's gonna charge very small transaction fees. So think about single digit basis points. Um, and um, maybe with programmability, some of these transactions could kind of have slightly higher fees, for example, if they implement a conditional payment uh, using the move programming language, uh, such as, you know, think about an escrow transaction. Now, these very low transaction fees are possible uh, because DM does not rely on proof of work. And in fact, one of the first things we, we, we adventured um, with, with, with my co-authors when we started working on this project was really going through systematically all the consensus algorithm and think about trade-offs. Uh, now, proof of work, I, I think, works really well in certain, in certain settings where, for example, institutions are extremely weak, uh, but the wasteful computation and the energy impact uh, it's something that, at least in the case of DM, uh, we did not want, want to incentivize. Um, moreover, there's a broader economic challenge, which is if you're relying on proof of work and incentivizing miners to perform wasteful computation, it's very difficult to upgrade the quality of the system. So DM is kind of a hybrid starting as, as kind of a BFT uh, type of consensus, but also evolving by introducing market forces into it, into something that, uh, that's somewhat novel uh, in terms of its economic properties.
This is where the association members come into the picture in securing that network at the start by running validator nodes, but also by scaling use cases in application, not just in the commercial space, uh, but also uh, you know, when it comes to financial inclusion. Now, a key property here is really that this is designed not to be a wallet garden, and, and it's modeled after the open technology standards of the internet. Interoperability, as I was mentioning at the beginning, is going to be extremely important for driving competition across a number of dimensions, uh, including, including privacy. So this is a network that is kind of different than existing stablecoins because it's optimized for, for payment. And just to kind of to recap, you know, you have the design of the coins, you have the design of the reserve, you also have a novel compliance framework, for example, that implements things like the travel rule or sanctions at the protocol level to ensure that the system is safe. Um, and, and really to summarize, you know, the, the key questions on this are, you know, wh why even build a stablecoin? Often people ask, you know, isn't the current payment system enough or aren't upgraded? upgrades to RTGS enough for, for reaching some of the same uh, benefits. Well, we do believe that these digital rails uh, are actually much more efficient. They're gonna reduce costs, delays, uh, allow for all sort of real-time payments, and most, most importantly, reduce fragmentations in payments. So the stablecoin is almost like a retrofitting exercise of the newer digital rails on the old system. Now, what areas are we innovating on beyond technology? I think it's really on standards, uh, higher standards for consumer protection. I've already talked extensively about the reserve design and also ensuring that this is a system that can operate in many regions of the globe without interfering uh, with macroeconomic policy or, or, or even financial stability. The second key area is like you know, robust financial crime uh, compliance standards throughout the ecosystem. We think this is gonna be extremely important going back to that interplay between code and institutions for these systems to eventually scale uh, beyond their early adopters. I wanna spend the last few minutes on, on kind of how we think of DM as a complement really to the public sector's journey uh, towards CBDCs and this concept of a public-private par partnership um, in the future. Now, when we, when we published our first white paper, at the time it was called Libra, as you see, there was kind of a real bump in, in attention and interest for central bank digital currencies. Um, and, and, and to some extent, that's, that's probably been the, the biggest achievement of the project to date, which is accelerating a lot of interest and, and work on the public sector side, which we do think it's a massive complement to what we're trying to do. Uh, and in fact, even if you read, for example, uh, the Bank of England's discussion paper on CBDCs, um, the bank also acknowledges that, you know, this needs to be a collaboration between private sector and public sector uh, so that it can really achieve um, its, its maximum potential. So when I end, uh, I'm thinking through these comparative advantages of kind of public sector on one side and the private sector, because that's essentially how we think about um, it from, from the DM perspective, the public sector will always have the key advantage in providing stability, preserving value um, of, 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 of fiat, and also in developing the core settlement layer uh, for, for certain society, right? So that this is high resilience infrastructure that should be public and um, may also be able to replicate some of the important properties of cash in a digital space. Uh, the public sector also plays a major role in setting rules to ensure you know, consumer protection. Uh, right now, we think at least in stablecoin design, we're not there yet. And in fact, we're trying to innovate um, and other issues like market integrity, you know, macroeconomic stability and, and, and so on. Public sector can also play a key role in forcing and pushing for interoperability so that you really get good competitive dynamics, not only on the network, uh, such as DM, but also between networks like DM and, and other networks. And, and of course, there's broader challenges for this to be uh, good on the global scale, you need to harmonize legal frameworks. Um, so where does the private sector come in? Uh, we think that the private sector will, will have an advantage actually on the consumer and business facing side in developing the type of products and experiences that consumers and merchants, for example, will need. It's also in a better position probably to experiment with programmability because programmability, of course, uh, may, may, may require uh, additional functionality and that may come at the trade-off of higher resilience. Uh, and so very much like we've seen with the internet, I think you know, there's a range of new business models uh, that you can get when the public sector is actually uh, collaborating with the private one. And more broadly, uh, we think that the, the private public collaboration will definitely accelerate time to market for many countries interested in, in central bank digital currencies. Again, going back to the picture of the early internet, uh, this was uh, heavily US-based at the time, but it really speaks to, to you know, private and public effort in the early stages of a general purpose technology, uh, such as cryptocurrencies and blockchain being complements, not, not being substitutes. And uh, so jump 
jump a few years into the future, these are actually more recent pictures of the internet, one in 2003 and one in 2010. As you can see, that is really the, the representation of the, the exponential growth uh, of activity and innovation that we've witnessed in, in, in the last uh, decades. So thank you for your attention. I look forward to discussing this with you live. Thank you very much, Christian. That was a fascinating uh, discussion. That slide at the end certainly shows the scale of change that we're talking about. Uh, there is one question that I know you are asked several times each day, uh, but the viewers will want me to ask this. You are awaiting the FINMA license. When is this going to happen? Yeah, so, you know, as, as a project, we, we, we took a different stand than many projects that are live today. So uh, starting with the white paper, which was the initial start of that conversation, and has really driven a lot of change uh, in our design, as you can compare, you know, not only white paper one and white paper two, but some of the content you've seen on the slides today is very, is very different. Um, so the timeline is, is not for DiEM uh, to choose. It, it's in the hands of the regulators. And, and you know, we're, we're working through that process. And we think in the end, the type of changes and improvements that we're making uh, will be important for, for the system at scale. Thank you very much. Uh, we will obviously all watch with interest to see what happens. Um, one of the questions I've got is about the business model. So you spoke about the kind of transaction fees being the kind of business model of how that works. But I've got a couple of um, sort of further queries about that. So if you look at um, how transaction fees normally work, I mean, there'll be VASPs, there'll be wallets, there'll be a transaction fee there, there might be the merchant taking a transaction fee. If all these different parties take a transaction fee as part of the DM process, how is this something which helps the uh, customer? Will, will it not mean there are simply more transaction fees if that's the if that's the ultimate business model? Yeah, so that that's a really important question. So, and I think the closest example is what happened, for example, with India in India with UPI. Um, when you have shared infrastructure, when you bring interoperability into the picture, not only you reduce the number of intermediaries, right? Because in a sense, let's say at scale, you're paying a single digit. Um, basis point to, to DM, uh, but then maybe you need a payment service provider or some other integration for accepting payments as a merchant. What we've seen over time is that when you do allow for more competition, uh, those prices tend to be, come down substantially. So even at scale, not only you have a network that can operate at a fraction of the cost of the current system and legacy rails, uh, but also the market structure is really what will matter. Uh, I think cost in payments today often are high uh, because of lack of competition. Uh, and, and, and in fact, in markets where the public sector has, has made changes to improve competition, um, those costs have come down dramatically already. Sure. And so and that those these transaction fees will be the main driver of the business model. Will there be other sources of income? I mean, there's obviously uh, uh, liquidity pools uh, and, and, and liquid assets that will be purchased or that will be part of the underlying security, because you explained the reason for that when you were looking at the, the, the CBDC line. Um, and I'm also interested to know, I mean, obviously, before this starts, what, what's the business model right now? Is it the founding members? Is there what? How, how is it going as, as things stand at the moment? Yeah, so like any other startup, you know, initial funding is what um, keeps this phase of, of the project running. Uh, at scale, the transaction fees are going to be uh, the key driver. Um, you know, going back to the future evolution uh, and integration with the CBDC, we're essentially already assuming that, you know, yields on a reserve whether extremely low like they are today or non-existent in a world where maybe there is a CBDC token uh, should not be part of the business model in the long run um, because again, they're likely to disappear as the system evolves. And, and, and the simple explanation of why we think transaction fees are gonna be sustainable, it's because that's where the network is adding value. When you think about distributed trust and what kind of the protocol really does, it's clearing and settlement across a number of participants. Uh, and, and so that's gonna be the main driver of growth for, for DM. Thank you very much. I, I think you, you answered the questions very fully and the presentation was more um, comprehensive than some of the things we've seen previously, particularly on how a stable coin is even better than a one to one with the um, high liquid assets. There is still this fear of what one of our panelists earlier today called the DPEG event. Something happens with DM, with Libra, with Facebook, something that we haven't thought of that simply takes away that security. As that may still be a fear in people's minds. And as in any case, you expect the final situation to be with a digital dollar rather than a DM dollar. Have you simply considered calling up the, the Fed or the Treasury in the US and saying, let us make 
the digital dollar for you? So again, we, we don't think of DM as, as being a provider for infrastructure for the digital dollar, right? We, we see it as one of the many payment networks that potentially could take advantage of a digital dollar where it to become a reality. Uh, when it comes to the depegging event, our current design is essentially uh, you know, 90 days or less US treasuries and then additional capital requirements and buffers. And, and the intuition behind that is that we wanted to minimize counterparty risk exposure even to a bank custodian. Uh, it, it's the best design we can uh, really deliver given current regulation. Uh, but I think we've already seen, for example, with the presidential working group document that came out in December of last year, uh, that likely there, there's gonna be new regulation and, and new rules for how these systems should be designed. And we really look forward to you know, implementing those rules uh, when they become available. Thank you very much, Christian. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but thank you for the effort that you have put into that. I know many of our viewers have found that very interesting, and I can see lots of questions that we will continue to share with you. If you have a question that you didn't get to answer, please email me on chris.ostrowski at omfif.org. Christian is always eager to hear from our members and our viewers about how he can engage with the discussions um, throughout this time. It's not just isolated during this one presentation. But we do need to move on to the next presentation now. So thank you very much, Christian. I'm sure we'll see you again soon. Thank you, Chris. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Bye.